It's amazing. Uh, uh, the first time it happened to me was uh, I took a message to a, this, this is, really is important because we, we made that one point about the shells, but I took a message to um, this engineer officer that was building the bridge over Malandroni. Uh, it was the Malandroni Bridge, so-called. And uh, uh, just before I got there, the Germans started shelling. And the only cover there was was a shallow ditch on the side of the road. So I dove into the ditch and a shell came, uh, an 88 shell came and buried itself in the bank just 12 inches from my head and didn't go off. I'll tell you. Another time, we were running down a slope and we were in um, a path that the engineers had made through a minefield, so we, we, couldn't, we couldn't dodge. We had to just follow this line. And so the Germans zeroed in on it and a mortar shell came down and exploded right in front of me, or I mean hit right in front of me, and didn't explode. It too would have destroyed me. And then there was still another one later on. So I tell you, it was, they saved a lot of lives. Did you ever wonder why or why not? No, because it's chance. Um, you know, some of the most wonderful, worthwhile guys were destroyed, and others who weren't worth that much were, were saved. Uh, no, um, we never had any question about why we were there, even though it turns up in, in books like McKay's. Uh, at the time, I never heard uh, any of this real questioning, you know, why are we there and, and why didn't we just sit and wait until the war was over and, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of speculation like that. I don't remember any of that at the time. We were doing what we were told to do and, and uh, we knew we were winning and we knew we were succeeding at what we were doing and guys were getting killed. And uh, to me, that was sort of it. Uh, these, the only question, you've heard the story about the, the reporter from Yank who came he came to our outfit. In fact, he went to a lot of different outfits. He was looking for atheists in foxholes because, you know, the saying is there are no atheists in foxholes. And you read these books and it sounds like there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, he came to the 87th. And he, in fact, he came to regimental headquarters and said, uh, who should I interview? You know, uh, this, is my, this is what I'm doing. And um, the lieutenant he talked to knew me. He said, well, I can tell you one guy you ought to talk to is Bob Parker, and he's over there, you know. <laughs> so he came over and sat down uh, and interviewed me about atheists and foxholes. And uh, he said, well, first of all, I want to know, uh, of course, you're, you believe. You're, and I said, no, I don't. And he said, oh, you don't? And I said, no. And uh, why not? And I said something like, I can't remember anymore, what kind of a god would it be who would allow something like this awful war to go on? Uh, and that's all I said to him. And he, he ran in, the, in Yank. And 6,000 miles away, my mother read it in Yank newspaper. Later on, she told me about it. <laughs> so were you the token atheist in a foxhole? I was the atheist. Not, not the only one that he found, but just about the only one. It's interesting. You know, he did this, and everybody says, oh, yeah, I'm, I believe, and no, I'm not an atheist. And Of course, there's a God, and so on. And, but I had pretty well decided by that time that there was not. So. But what do you think it was that got, did get you through some of the most difficult situations? Chance. Well, no. Part of it was this training that I talk about as a kid. Um, one of the things that I did that I'm sure saved my life was I didn't believe in these little short entrenching tools that we had, which didn't work in the mountains because we were working on rocky soil and stuff like that. 
So I went down to the engineer. Uh, uh, what would you call it? Their, their quartermaster, the supply sergeant, engineer supply sergeant, and ask him if by any chance he could sell me or give me or, or somehow let me have an engineer shovel, which is a full-size shovel, you know. Like the, you've seen them on the back of Jeeps, well, that's, or on the back of weasels. Well, that's, that's the shovel. It's the Ames number two. Just, and uh, he said, well, I can't give you one. I can't sell you one, he said, but um, I got something I got to do. I'm going to turn my back, and if you want to go back and look in there, you'll probably find a shovel. Well, he turned his back. I went around behind the counter, went in, in, in the, his uh, supply room, and there were hundreds of shovels. So I grabbed one, got out of there, thanked him on the way out, and the rest of the campaign, I carried this shovel. And whenever we stopped, I dug in with this. And I know, because we went through shelling after shelling, and uh, I was safely ensconced in a deeper hole than most of the guys had. Did you say that shovel saved your life? Oh, yeah, time after time. But it was, you know, I, I said to myself, this entrenching tool is worthless, especially, and in the story, uh, in uh, Punchboard Hill, the first uh, foxhole I dug was a big, deep, comfortable one. That's the one that Lauren was killed in. Why don't you tell the whole story of Punchboard Hill right from the beginning? Well, we're not there yet. Or do, oh, you, okay. do you want to go? Well, why don't you do because you're starting on the shovel thing. Oh, you want me to tell that story on tape? Punchboard Hill. Oh, Punchboard Hill. Oh. Um, well, one of the objectives of our regiment after Belvedere um, was some routes through the mountains, one of which went through what was called Malandroni Pass, and which involved a bridge over a steep gully. Uh, and that bridge was called Malandroni Bridge. And um, that route through the mountains was one of the ways that we knew we had to, one of the areas that we knew we had to capture uh, before we could move on. And the 3rd Battalion was given the right-hand side of that uh, uh, whole objective. And I forget who was on the left. It doesn't really matter. But the 3rd Battalion uh, dug in on a mountain called uh, La Serra. No, the town was called La Serra, so the mountain was uh, Monte Serra. It wasn't, it wasn't a big mountain, but, you know, one of those small Apennine mountains. And they dug in in um, a very thick chestnut grove. You know, the chestnuts were all killed in this country, but they're still growing in Europe. And they're a major food source in, in the mountains of Italy. Anyway, uh, the Germans realized that we were attacking and trying to capture that pass. And so they leveled the heaviest artillery concentration on the 3rd Battalion and on this whole Malandroni area um, that had been experienced by the 5th Army uh, since uh, Anzio. It was terrific. Well, during a, um, a break in that shelling, we came in, the recon platoon came in to put an observation post on top of that mountain uh, of La Serra so that we could watch for enemy movements and so on. And so we moved in sort of in the early afternoon, um, and there was no place for a foxhole where the 3rd Battalion was because uh, there were so many guys there and there'd been so much shelling and all the trees were destroyed and so on. So we had left a kind of a clearing on the side of the mountain and uh, the lieutenant sent another guy and me up the mountain to look for a place to, to build an OP. But you didn't do that in the daytime. You, 
did it at night and camouflaged it and then occupied it during the day. Anyway, so we found a location. And then the lieutenant told us to, we ought to dig in. Um, and uh, because the, the Germans shelled every evening. And so uh, on the side of this kind of uh, scratchy slope was this little bench uh, that had accumulated soil, obviously uh, accumulated water. And I thought, this, here's a great place to dig a foxhole. So I dug a big foxhole. But when I got through doing it, I, I started thinking about the way the German shells uh, uh, come in. Um, and there are two kinds of, of course, artillery, the, the long, the distant, um, flat, basically flat tra trajectory, and then the close, close up, like the 88 flat tra tra trajectory uh, cannon, and then the 105s and the mortars, which uh, are an arcing trajectory. And I realized that uh, the damage that had been done on, on Punchboard Hill had been done by mortars and 105s because they arced over the top of the mountain and came down and, and destroyed this forest and killed guys and so on. And I thought, you know, I don't like this little bench because it, the a 105 is li liable to come in and, and hit the bench. So I moved up the slope and scratched out a minimal foxhole in this hard, uh, uh, rocky soil, and by that time it was about four o'clock, and just then uh, our intelligence sergeant, Lorne Frank, arrived, and he reported to the lieutenant, and uh, with him was a uh, replacement soldier, a nice guy though, John Van de Pudy. and John uh, looked at my empty foxhole and said, whose hole is this? And I said, well, I dug it, but I don't like it. It sticks out of the slope too much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it. And uh, Lauren came back and looked at the foxhole and looked at the mountain and said, well, this, you know, this is good enough for me. Johnny, you better dig in next to me, which Johnny did. And, uh, and of course, oh, half an hour later, the German shelling stopped and or started and, uh, Three quarters of an hour later, and they were both dead. And they were in that on that bench that I had given up because I was afraid it was a perfect target for a 105, and that's what happened, direct hit. Um, but there again, I was saved because I had witnessed how shells acted and that they, they picked benches like that to hit into because, and if you were on the mountain slope, the shell was likely to go over you, but if you were on a bench, it was likely to hit you. And uh, also, um, you know, it was a self-protective thing, and I figured uh, I don't want to be there when it starts, when the shells start coming in. And, uh, and Lauren didn't think it through, and so they were killed and I was saved. I was spared, I guess is the word. Do you think you made your own luck in that case? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, uh, and I warned Johnny. I said, uh, why, he asked me, you know, why'd you, why, do, why didn't you use it? And I said, well, I did, I, it sticks out of the slope too much. And he saw where I was. I'd gone up the slope, and he, they could have. They could have gone up the slope. They would have been saved, too, because uh, there were, I think, 15 of us maybe only 10. Uh, we were different size groups each time we put up an observation post, but uh, uh, all the other guys were safe because they were, like me, they'd scratched a minimal foxhole in this steep slope. And uh, the two guys that didn't were the only ones that were killed. How'd you feel about that later? Oh, well, there was no later. I, we. Uh, we walked them out of there, 
in body bags and uh, and uh, the lieutenant found a radio and radioed in what had happened and the colonel said well you better come out of there he excused us from building that OP and uh, by the time I got back to where we were staying, where we were sleeping, um, I don't remember any of that. And then for five days, I don't remember anything. Just, they're totally wiped out. Luckily, the lieutenant kept me with, with them, and um, they'd make sure I was fed and clothed and so forth. And, and uh, on the, late on the fifth day, one of my buddies and I were sitting together on the terrace of this uh, Italian house that we were sleeping in. And, um, all of a sudden, I was back. And uh, luckily, again, Hawk, this guy that sat next to me, and, and the others uh, filled me in on what had been happening and what had happened, because I didn't remember any of it. And. Uh, Two days later, we went back into action, and I was fine. But uh, I wasn't able to even think about it or write about it until 50 years later. Who do you think you were during those five days? Um, the mind has a wonderful way to, to, to be able to protect itself. And I think the horror of it was just so much that uh, the mind just shut off. Uh, and uh, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. You know, a lot of guys suffered from, th this was a typical case of, uh, uh, we called it uh, combat fatigue. In the First World War, they called it shell shock. And then we called it combat fatigue. And then later on, it was called post-traumatic syndrome and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, a lot of guys, were damaged that way mentally. They were sent back to hospitals. They were sent away from their units. And a lot of them never recovered. I think I recovered because my lieutenant was smart enough to keep me with the group. And the minute I came back to, they filled me in. You know, they told me how the war was going, where we were, and so on, what had happened. And uh, I, think, I think that maintained my sanity. But a lot of guys, when they found themselves in, uh, in a strange surrounding with strangers and doctors asking them questions and so forth, you know, a lot of them never came out of that um, uh, combat fatigue, as we called it. <laughs> Are you still friends with some of those people today? Uh, I'm just trying to think. There's only... There's only two left that I know of. They're all gone. Um, Hawk is gone. Of course, Lauren and Johnny were gone right then and there. Bob Reynolds and, uh, boy, right now I can't. But uh, of the group as a whole, uh, most of them are gone. Did it ever come up again? No. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say no. Bob Reynolds and I talked briefly about it a few years ago. He used to come to our reunions. You know, he doesn't anymore, but... Uh, um, and our lieutenant is gone. Dave Arnold's dead. Did you have any, ever have any feedback from them on what they thought happened to you? No, except this helpfulness, you know. Um, I have a friend who had a uh, heart attack, quintuple bypass, and then he, then the stitches broke. He bled more than half of his body fluids into, in, into the interior of his body. Lost completely his near-term memory. His long-term memory was all right. They saved him. Um, in his case, his family 
and he's a great lawyer, was, still is. Um, his family and his law firm filled in all the short term for him. And his short term memory now is just as good as, as in fact, it's better than mine. So it can be done. And I was lucky to have someone do it for me. And Bob, this friend of mine, was also lucky to have a family who would, they spent months. They took, they got all his legal records and went through each case with him, and, you know, and reconstituted his short term memory. And I think it, that's the trouble with, with what happens to guys who go back to the field hospitals. And th nobody does that for them. But my, my buddies did that for me, and it was the greatest thing that could have happened. Did you ever get any sense from them that uh, they really thought you were in danger? Mentally in danger? No, you know, it's funny. I think if you're in that kind of a situation, uh, everybody understands how close they are to having something like that happen. So no one's surprised. Everyone helps. As I say, you know, they got me up, made sure I got dressed, made sure I got fed. Um, they knew there was nobody there. Mentally, there was nobody there. And, uh, and then they also knew when I snapped back because I, I said, Hawk, where are we? John Hawkinson, his name was. Hawk, where are we? You know, what's going on? <laughs> he says, well, you've been gone for five days. <laughs> yeah. Were you laughing then? Well, I might have. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, all I remember is that uh, I was uh, incredibly grateful to my friends and buddies and to the officer, uh, our lieutenant, for having kept me with them rather than, because otherwise, you know, I, I, I would have been a casualty and I would have been sent back and that was that. As it was, there was I was involved in quite a bit of war after that, and I was fine. What was the date of that? Um, the first week of March. It's in our records. Uh, it's the last day of the occupation of La Serra by the 3rd Battalion. I think it was the 2nd or 3rd of March. I can't be sure. But, uh, Do you think there was a general feeling that um, you wanted to stay with your unit no matter what, guys not wanting to go back, uh, even if they were injured, or just can't wait to get back on the line if they oh. are. There were, we had dozens of cases, dozens of cases like that. My one of my best friends, Len Landry, was wounded twice, came back twice, and the second time they sent him home. But how do you explain that? Well, same thing as I said. Uh, there was such a closeness, there was so much identification with one another and with the unit that it was, it was our world and we wanted to be part of it. I think if I'd been sent back, I would have wanted to return. Whether they would have sent me back, I don't know. But uh, uh, this happened over and over again. Oh yeah, we had a lot of guys who, you know. And Len came back, he still had bandages on his back. He came back, and two days later, he got more bandages on his back and all over his body, and he was out of there. But uh, people wanted to stay where the action was. Yeah. Well, no, they wanted to stay with their buddies and with the unit. And if there was action, okay. But no, it ha didn't have to do with action. It was loyalty. It, you know, this, the whole thing. Some of the guys you were with in Afghanistan must have understood uh, about this unit loyalty, which really is bigger than the individual. And uh, th we had it. We had it. Yeah. Now, between um, Belvedere and Punchboard Hill, what happened to you? Well, there were, um, we, my platoon, we did OPs, observation posts. Um, 
we had close calls. Like our own artillery knocked down a tree over over one of our OPs, and luckily none of us were hurt or killed, but it was close. And um, uh, one of the things that happened in, during that period was uh, uh, I just finished writing the story about the the dentist in the apple orchard. <laughs> That's funny. I had some dental work to be done, and uh, so I got signed up with this dentist, and his entire equipment was this chair and uh, one of those pedals that you push with your feet to turn the drill and a little cl cluster of instruments. And this chair was set up in an apple orchard uh, right outside of our regimental headquarters, which was an old Italian farmhouse. And right behind us was this mountain, Mount Della Vedetta, which the 3rd Battalion had captured just days before. And we knew that the mountain sheltered us from any artillery because the artillery couldn't reach down to where headquarters was. Um, so it went over everybody's head and landed down here. You know? And uh, But the dentist didn't know that. So I sat in the dentist chair and the, every day late in the afternoon the Germans would start shelling. And uh, shells came overhead and this dentist just disappeared into the cellar of this old farmhouse, you know, and he stuck his head out drowned. For a while there was no shelling, so he came out and he worked on me a little while. Then more shells came. <laughs> the third time this happened, I told him what was what was going on. In fact he asked me, he said, How the hell come you can sit there and be totally calm and and, and I felt like lying to him and say, Well it was I'm an old you know, I'm a I'm a veteran of this kind of thing. I said, No, Lieutenant, I I cannot tell a lie. We know that the Germans can't reach us here because of Mount Della Vedetta right up there. <laughs> so he finished up with my jaw, and that was the end of the, the dentist in the apple orchard. Yeah, just for his own nerves, he should move, it, move the chair. <laughs> that, yeah, that'd make a great scene in a, in a film. Because this lieutenant was terrified. You know, he wasn't a frontline guy at all. He, he just came up to fix people's teeth. And you see, regiment had told him that it was safe. Well, R and R, we went to um, Monacatini, and uh, that's a story I won't write. But uh, it's, it's anyway. We had um, yeah. There was uh, there were moments when we went to Monacatini, and and uh, they took all our clothes away because they were so they were almost rotted. They were so dirty. They gave us new clothes. But before they gave us new clothes, we had we bathed in this wonderful big uh, Montecatini, uh, uh, what would you call it, a, a hot springs resort. So I marched down the naked as a jaybird down the these marble hallways, and I was assigned to a certain room. And I walked in this room with a great big marble tub, and here was a Italian lady with a brush and a towel and soap and so forth. And she said, now, what do you want me to do? Wash your back first and so on. I'm going, you know, we were, we were just young Americans. We weren't used to that. <laughs> and uh, I went to the opera in, in Florence. And, uh, and I got to visit some of my buddies in the hospital. I went to Leghorn and, and uh, I visited, for one, this, this guy I'm talking about, Len Landry, who was there after his first wound, and I uh, saw Pete, Pete Seibert, saw a bunch of the guys, and um, then, uh, were you, then were we were back. Were you on a continue? Was there still people fighting? Oh yeah, on the, but they rotated us out, but there wasn't a lot of action on the, on the front. There was shelling and stuff like that, but how, how did you we were about, between. Well, how did you feel about being on the continue, you know, relaxing, knowing that there were still guys being shelled. Oh, well, all you say is, thank God I have a chance to get clean and, you know. And uh, uh, I had my first Marsala con Wolvi and, you know, little things like that. 
that you remember. But uh, we knew we were going back soon, and we did. And what is a Marsala contain? Conwovi. That's Marsala wine. You know what that is. It's a sweet wine uh, mixed with an egg, just mixed up. So it turns out in a kind of a yellow, creamy. And it's a, one of the drinks that they serve, and it's a great... I wasn't into booze in those days. I like wine, but I... And Marsala con Wolvi was kind of like a dessert, you know. Now, as you were um, moving along after Punsport Hill and after you kind of returned from your out-of-body experience, uh, what happened to you next? Well, next came the, the major offensive starting April 14th, the day after the president died. You know, they, they, held the, they held it up not because Roosevelt was sick. I forget what the reason was. They held up the first day of the offensive. It should have been the 13th, or maybe it was even the 12th. No, it was the 13th. So it was held up one day, and, and then we started on the 14th. And um, then the division was in combat until the uh, 2nd of May. That's when we came down out of the hills, uh, crossed the Po Valley, crossed the Po River uh, to Verona, then west to Lake Garda, then up the shores of Lake Garda. And the war ended for us when we were getting ready to head for the, to fight our way to the Austrian border. Well, how about if you um, go over some of the details about what were the circumstances before you earned the first medal? <laughs> The first medal was about uh, was about the the Belvedere, uh, but the lieutenant didn't know what to say, so yeah, he just said, um, Cour "Courage in action, under fire, and so forth." The second one was was more specific because it was about what really happened in the Po Valley. But, well, can you describe for me what were the circumstances <laughs> leading up to it? Yeah, we were, we, we were sent on patrol up a side road off of the main highway we were on. Uh, Les Alki and, and I in a Jeep. And we were fired on by a German roadblock. And so we hit the, in fact, Les drove the Jeep right into the ditch. And we piled out and, uh, and returned fire and... Uh, drove the enemy away from the roadblock and uh, reported back, and uh, it's in the citation. That's a more realistic citation. The other one was kind of a general, well, Parker's been a good good soldier, and he went through this and he went through that, so he ought to get a... <laughs> they did that, you know. How do you explain, like, one guy does something that seems heroic or extraordinary, another guy doesn't, one guy gets a medal, one guy doesn't. Well, it was all a question of, you know, the funny thing is I was surprised by both uh, of mine because the lieutenant didn't like me. But he, I guess he didn't feel he had any choice because, uh, yeah, a lot of the guys didn't get him. Uh, it was, um, a lot of guys should have. A friend of mine who lives, who lived until he died uh, in Pecos, New Mexico, which is near Santa Fe, um, sh he should have had the, at least the Silver Star. He was, however, he was a wire sergeant. His job was to keep our wire communication telephone. You know, the radios, for one thing, if you took a radio on a patrol and then it blared out noisy, then you were... You were screwed, so you didn't take them on patrol. Um, and uh, the same with night combat. Radios were dangerous. You know, the minute they, any noise came from radio, the Germans would zero in on you. So the only, co the only communications that the colonel had with everybody in the front line was, was telephone. And it was sound power telephone, you know. And uh, the German shells cut the wires constantly. So the wire guys were always out there under fire, uh, patching wires, making sure that the colonel could communicate with his headquarters or with his uh, frontline guys. And uh, 
And he went through, you know, four months of that. And he got a bronze star, but he should have gotten at least a silver star because we'd all be in our foxholes, cowering in our foxholes, and Andy would be out there patching wire on the surface. He had to be, you know. He couldn't be in a foxhole. And uh, oh, he was a great man and a lovely guy beside. I got to know him when I moved down to New Mexico. Got to know him really well. I knew him, you know, the way you do. But uh, And uh, he was the... I used to joke about his, his, he was the marshal of Pecos for 25 years. He was the, the leading uh, uh, police officer in the county. And uh, I called him the, the law west of the Pecos because his house happened to be on the west side of the Pecos River. You, you know about the law west of the Pecos? That's in all Texas. Uh, there was no law west of the Pecos for a long time. The river runs down through Texas. And on the west side were the Comanches and all the bad guys and the, you know, the crooks. And, and so there was no law west of the Pecos. But I, I used to call Andy the law west of the Pecos. Great um, guy. Now, where does the unlikely encounter fit into this timeline? Well, that, that was after the war. And uh, uh, when, when the war was over, we had, uh, I've written up another story you haven't seen, I don't think, called the Marmalada. Because uh, so those of us who had mountain skills were assigned to teach mountaineering to guys who didn't. And uh, our first assignment, Dick Wright and I, he was an old friend of mine from E Company, and it just happened. We ended up together along with an officer. Um, and the, there was a, there's a marvelous refugio, marvelous mountain hotel at the base of the Marmalada Glacier. And uh, uh, Dick and I thought we'd go up a couple days early with this lieutenant and try to climb and ski the Marmalada because we knew it, it was snow covered at the time. So we did. Oh, it was a great trip and beautiful and historic. And, and, uh, but when I got off the mountain, I had new orders. Uh, and so, then I think we went, uh, where did we go? And then I was picked to be driver for this trip to Austria. And that's when, when we ran into Joe in Innsbruck. Robert, can you kind of tell the story in a linear way? Well, they needed an enlisted... Siggy Engel and Len Landry and uh, no, I'm having a senior moment, but uh, Russ McJury uh, 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 needed a driver for this trip. They were going to go and find friends in uh, uh, in Germany and find Siggy's family in Austria. That was one of the reasons for the trip. And uh, McJury had somehow got a hold of a, a jeep, and he said to Landry, "Do you know?" A, an enlisted man who could be our driver. And he said, well, you know. so he got, they got a hold of me. And so I ended up driver. And we drove by Jeep uh, over uh, the Brenner Pass and down into, into uh, Innsbruck and found that Siggy's family's building, which they owned, had been blown to smithereens. And we were looking for some kind of records in the uh, U.S. Army military government building when we ran into Joe Frankenstein, only he was called something Wolf. He was Lieutenant Wolf, that's all I remember. And, uh, and that night he told us this wonderful story about what he'd been doing, which was uh, uh, perhaps not typical of, but there were many, many OS, OSS, Office of Strategic Services guys who did equally dangerous and exciting uh, things behind the lines in Europe. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any guys like that who could go into Japan and so on, because there were, all the Japanese were uh, in uh, detention camps and so forth. But we had all kinds of Austrian, German, French, Swiss, 
uh, Polish guys who could be inserted behind the lines and could get away with it. And in Joe's case, he got away with it. He imitated a German officer. Uh, you know, by the way, we should, uh, I'm sure you can cut this. Uh, oh, it's 12. Yeah. I expect Laurie and Guy and his helpers and so What were the extraordinary contributions of the 10th in the post-World War? Mm -hmm. uh, one, you know, whether it's mountaineering environment, however, you know, ski industry. Um, so that we'll be talking about. You talk about subsequent um, post-war experiences, the civilian experiences um, that you think that the tents contributed environment, mountaineering, yeah. ski industry. I think my experience after the war was pretty typical um, of the whole experience of the tenth. In that, as soon as I could, I applied to Western universities. Uh, to go back to school, and uh, fortunately, the University of Washington was the first to respond because the, because Washington was on a quarter system, and they said I could get in the winter quarter if I arrived by February fifteenth in Seattle, uh, and I wanted to be near the mountains, and of course I, I knew the the Northwest already, so uh, I enrolled in the University of Washington. Uh, some of the tenth guys who were at the university uh, were on the ski team. Uh, John Woodward, for example, was assistant manager of the uh, university bookstore. Uh, there were a lot of tenth guys there. And then in the summer, a lot of us, I guided the first summer of 46 in the Wind River Mountains, uh, ski and climbing guide, and then uh, on the following summer on Mount Rainier as a climbing guide, summit guide. And uh, then I got married. And uh, so my guiding experience at that point was over. So we, uh, I finished school. We went to Europe. I raced in Europe. I raced against Bill Brown. Uh, he may not admit it, but I, be I beat him in the most important race of his or my life as far as I was concerned. But uh, which was the U.S. forces in Austria slalom, and uh, uh, then I contributed uh, articles to National Skiing, which till uh, at that point was a newspaper uh, for several years, and then when we returned from when the occupation ended in Austria, we returned to the states. I went to work under Bill Dunaway in, at National Skiing. Our publisher was Merrill Hastings, who was another 10th Mountain guy. Um, and uh, Bill left to take over the Aspen Times, and I became editor, and I, Merrill and I turned National Skiing into Skiing Magazine, which he later sold. And then I went to work for uh, Vail, and uh, was with Vail for 25 years. So I was involved in, in uh, first of all, ski writing, and then ski publishing, guiding. Uh, I was president of the, of the Husky Winter Sports Club, which was the largest ski club in the world at that time, 500 people at the University of Washington. Uh, and uh, so I guided, instructed, wrote about skiing, published a, sk a skiing publication, and then I was an executive of a ski resort company for 25 years, and uh, that sort of broad experience describes that of many guys, you know. First they went back to school, or some of them had already graduated. Uh, Dave Browder, Brower, I think, uh, had graduated from Cal, I'm not sure. He's the great en environmentalist. Um, I know that uh, um, the Nike guy, geez, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, Bill Bowerman. Yeah, Bill Bowerman was already coach. He'd graduated, he was older. Um, 
he was already a coach. Uh, uh, let's see. The guys at Washington who coached were Buster Campbell and then Carl Stingle, both from the 87th. Uh, and this happened all across the country. Do you have uh, Dick Wilson's book? Yeah. Uh, you follow the lives of all these guys, and, and uh, they're all very similar. Uh, one way or another, they were going to be involved in the mountains and in skiing or in mountain climbing or the outdoors uh, because we had discovered that there, that there was this outdoor life that one could make a living at. And so we did, you know, and, and uh, uh, although I was an office executive, more or less, at Vail for 25 years, still, there was all the, the excitement and, uh, and creative uh, feeling about starting a resort as there was about starting a ski school or starting... Uh, a ski publication. It was about the things that we were used to doing and loved doing. And, and, uh, and there were literally hundreds of guys that uh, followed a similar, similar pattern one way or another. Did it seem like work to you? Uh, well, at times, of course. But, uh, well, you know, publishing a, a magazine is no, it's no, it's, it's a 14 hour a day, seven days a week job. But in doing it, you get to meet guys like Stein Erickson and, you know, all the great ski stars and so on, and write about <clears throat> people like that, and write about positive things like uh, improving uh, the legislative process so that ski areas have some kind of legislative direction, um, so that uh, there is... Um, uh, there are laws. That's going to ring because that's the close one. So what have I? What, have, what huge things have we missed? You asked about Bohr. Hi, Diane Lori. This is Beth White. Um, You'll have to ask me a question. <laughs> did well. The question was: Did it really feel like work being in the outdoor industry post-war? No. So like, think about it today where you have people running big ski industries that, not that they're not skiers, but you yeah. know, it's a little bit different approach. Well, the world has changed. Uh, the ski world has changed. Unfortunately, um, uh, skiing has become a major industry. Uh, ski resorts have become a major industry. But uh, when we started Vail, it was still about skiing. And, uh, and the people we knew, the people who could help, uh, and there were all these terrific, you know, ski instructors and, and, uh, and mountain men like uh, up here in the mountains of Colorado. All the guys, the early guys who helped us build the resort were mountain guys who did everything. You know, they drove cats. And in the summertime, they drove cattle and rode horses. and. Uh, wonderful bunch of human beings. Um, but the ski industry itself was still about skiing. Not anymore, and it's about the bottom line now. Um, so we didn't, you know, we weren't thinking about that really. All we wanted to do was continue to live and work in the mountains. How do you think your experiences and attempts shaped your attitudes about war? <sighs> well, I happen to think that uh, uh, our war, the Second World War, was necessary. Um, the subsequent wars that our country has been in, I don't think have been necessary. Uh, perhaps Korea. Uh, we didn't have much choice but to go into Korea. But. Um, most of the subsequent wars have been essentially political, and um, therefore they involved a lot of guys being killed who needn't have been killed. Um, I think personally that 
war is something that, or something like it, is something that human males need. Um, in my case, uh, the experience was both terrible and and challenging and uh, exciting. Uh, and it helped to form my character. But I don't rec recommend it as a way to form one's character. I think that if it happens to one and it's a, and a, if it's an honest war, then those who survive uh, should have learned from it, I learned a lot from it. Uh, unfortunately, wars that aren't necessary, a lot of great young men are killed who needn't have been killed because probably the war could have been uh, avoided and uh, a solution other than war could have been found. That's what I think about the current war. It, uh, there is no real excuse for our men being killed there except uh, a few men's ambition and a few men's, uh, a few leaders, uh, a twisted idea of what patriotism is all about. What do you think is the essence of the tenth? Well, the essence of the tenth is uh, probably a fantastic experience for a group of young men, all of whom, many of whom shared a love of the mountains and of skiing and of the outdoors. Um, even though a lot of those fabulous young men were killed in the process. Is there anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I, I, I think one way or another. <laughs> but you know, I, I told you, you've turned it off, haven't you? Yeah, turn it off. Happened in combat that were directly related uh, that I've written about, uh, and only a few that you know preceded combat and and uh, or were or just uh, like the sauna we built and uh, the skis that uh, our Scandinavian guys built for us and uh, on on Kiska. If you, um, even though these are combat stories, they're also stories about human nature. Yeah. Would you agree? And do you think that as stories of human nature, they sort of transcend the period that all of this happened to you? And it, yes, it happened to you in the tent. It happened to you in World War II. But when you look back on it sort of in a big sort of way, are these stories of human nature that kind of transcend that whole time period? Um, I would say yes and no, because... Um, like this first sergeant story, that wouldn't have happened except in combat, in a combat situation. You know, we were waiting to go to our next mission, whatever it was, and he decided he needed some kitchen police. Um, there's another one about uh, the captain and his uh, clerk who went out looking for Germans and killed Germans just so they could say they, they killed these Germans in, in uh, in civilian clothes. Uh, that's human nature, but it only could have happened in a, in a war situation. Um, uh, most of them, yeah, they're about human nature, but uh, human nature in a wartime situation that might not have happened otherwise. What do you think would be the ideals of the tent? The ideals? Ideals, the values of the tent. Oh. Well, the principal ideal of, uh, of the tent, I think, is uh, all of us have done or are doing our jobs the best way we could. Um, that, you know, that isn't quite as general as it may seem. I think our generation 
absolutely had that as a, as a basic foundation thought. The job that we were given, we're going to do it. Um, and not complain, you know, do it. And if the job is tough and hard and dangerous, well, you do it. Um, there's still a lot of men and women uh, who think that way, but unfortunately, I, I don't think it's as general as it maybe was in, in our generation. And then secondly, of course, if you can, you do a job in the out of doors, in the mountains. I know you're no longer an atheist in the foxhole, but now that you've- Yes, oh, I'm an atheist, though. So. You're not in the foxhole. No. Um, when you look back, do you see any pattern that enabled you to sort of survive or any force that you think sort of made it all possible? I'm a, I'm a real atheist. Um, see, I'm, I'm a scientist, too. And uh, everything, uh, well, it goes back to my experience in, uh, I was learning to, I was taking the course to be confirmed in the, in the Episcopal Church. And uh, my teacher told me I had to buy into the uh, Genesis theory and I had to repeat it when asked and so on. And I said, well, how, does the, how do the dinosaurs and the fossils and all that fit in? And he said, they don't. He said, you're expected to repeat it just as, as it is in the Bible. And I was 14 years old, and I said, well, in that case, I'm out of here. And I walked out of the class, walked home, told my mother she was all upset because she was the religious one, or she was the Episcopalian one. And I told my father, and he said, is this what you really believe? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, we're with you. And uh, I haven't been in a church since, except out of curiosity, you know, and so on. <laughs> well, these, uh, it's everyone's choice, but I don't, uh, I have a friend, by the way, who uh, believes that a certain group of scientists have found that there is an overarching order to the universe which their uh, calculations prove. And my only answer to her was, um, who did these calculations? Human beings. Uh, with what? With human machines. She said, yeah human machines, then as far as the rest of us know, isn't this a human? Uh, the period of, the t of time with the 10th Mountain Division, 1943 to 45, 42 to 45, whatever your time was, Yeah. Uh, what does that mean to you? What does that, that space in your life mean to you? Let me talk to Abby. Uh, I think uh, my time in the Army uh, was, f for me personally, a really necessary time because I was a, uh, a very uh, immature, young, uh, physically strong and tough, but otherwise inexperienced person when I went into the Army. And I came out having experienced a real war and a lot of wonderful adventures, and uh, it was a, a fundamental chunk of my life that, that really uh, formed what I was the rest of my life, so. Oh, you got okay. it. Oh my gosh, Bill, when yeah. he tells us